Well, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. Tonight we're going to get into First Peter, First Peter, and uh, and we're going to study First Peter. Uh, we'll see how far we get through it. Perhaps we'll do the whole thing. We'll see how it goes. So, um, just before I dive into that, and just before I get into the live chat to uh, to greet you guys, quick little um, reminder. Tomorrow we have special guests, uh, Jiva and Salojana Sam, going to be speaking about um, their new book, The Unbreakable Marriage. They have a lot of experience uh, hel- helping married couples. Um, they have over uh, approximately four decades of marriage experience themselves, plus a, almost that much, almost that amount of uh, experience, pastoral experience as well. And so we have had them on. They're no strangers to our live stream. We've had them on uh, last year. And so it is an honor and a privilege to have them on again uh, tomorrow. So for any of you who, um, even if you're thinking about getting married, you know, you need to listen to what uh, the wisdom and the knowledge that that Jiva and Salojana will share. Now, if you uh, are married and you just need a little bit of a tune-up in your marriage, or if you know of anybody, you know what? It doesn't even matter if they are believers or unbelievers. If you know of anybody that uh, needs a little tune-up in their marriage, tell them to tune in tomorrow. So that'd be tomorrow at regular time. That's 7 p.m. Eastern. So... uh, Just to be clear, that's tomorrow. That is Monday, October 24th, and 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll have um, Jeeva and Salojana with us. Um, Wonderful, wonderful couple, and uh, great wisdom and knowledge that they will share. Also, um, November 7th, this is Monday, November 7th, we will also have uh, Dr. Neil T. Anderson with us. Um, very uh, instrumental in in my walk in with God. Back in the early days, this particular book written by Neil T. Anderson um, has dramatically changed my life. And uh, so, Lord willing, he'll be with us as well. And talking about the same thing, talking about winning spiritual warfare, freedom in in Christ. So, Spiritual freedom from any kind of oppression or any kind of bondage that you or anyone else would be in. Um, Also looking forward to that. Very, uh, very, very important and very monumental live stream that's coming up. Okay, see what we have in the live chat. Uh, Kalamentos says shalom everyone billy says shalom Vinny says shalom seek the lord says shalom the great deception says shalom everyone and uh the tower time says shalom and howdy bless y'all brothers and sisters shalom 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 welcome welcome blessings multiplied to you in abundance we have psalm 94 says shalom since tomorrow is election day um okay so A lot of people would, I'm I'm pretty sure a lot of people are wondering, what in the world is Psalm 94 talking about election day tomorrow? Um, So uh, apparently where you are, uh, Psalm 94, you're talking, there's an election that's going on. So uh, there's something here. I thought maybe we could pray that God, God's will be done to get the right people in and, and to keep the evil people out of office, office. Yes. Yes, for sure. So whenever there's an election, we need to we need to pray um, that God's will be done. So let's do that now before we jump in. Father, we thank you, Father, for again this this evening. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with this this day, this evening, this night. Thank you, Father, for um, your your blessings. And Father, we ask you that you would. Um, uh, you would uh, oversee this election that Psalm 94 is talking about. Father, we ask that the uh, the least, <laughs> if I can put it this way, the least of all the evils get in. Um, we ask you, Father, that your will be done, that the most righteous person uh, that is running for, for office will be the one that gets in. Father, we ask that you would send your, your angels 
and your spirit to uh, to ensure that this happens. Your will be done in the name of Yeshua of Nazareth. Amen. 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 All right. Right on. Okay. So Psalm 94 says election day in Ontario. Uh, again, a lot of people uh, were wondering, is this Ontario, California or Ontario? Um, there's Ontario, California. There's actually, there's several different Ontarios, but, uh, but anyway, yes, definitely. We will, uh, we're praying, hoping and praying that wherever, uh, an election takes place, uh, and especially with, uh, the one that uh, Psalm 94 is speaking of, uh, it will happen um, as per God's will. Okay, well, as always, I pray that everything that we share today will be a great blessing to you, and uh, it would increase your knowledge of the Scriptures and your knowledge of the things of heaven and increase your relationship with, with God. Now, First Peter, we're going to get into First Peter tonight. Um. Here's something. Uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 1 Peter and 2 Peter. It is typically believed that, especially to, uh, 2 Peter, especially 2 Peter, is, is a forgery not written by Peter at all. However, uh, 1 Peter also uh, is an object of concern amongst many scholars. Uh, many scholars argue that Peter was not the author of First Peter either, uh, because uh, its writer appears to have appears to have a formal education in uh, in in rhetoric and philosophy and an advanced knowledge of the Greek language, an advanced knowledge of the Greek language, none of which would have been usual for for a Galilean fisherman. Now, we know in the scriptures that it says in Acts chapter 4 verse 13 now when the now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men they marveled so apparently according to acts peter was unlearned and ignorant if you look it up in the original greek it 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 literally says that he didn't basically it means that he didn't know how to he didn't know how to write he wasn't uh agramatos which means uh in negative to gramatos which means um uh can't write uh, basically um not literate okay so uh that's what it means literally okay so this is something that i think needs to be pointed out that according to Acts 4.13, Peter and John were both uh, illiterate men, uh, ignorant men, as it says here. Um, now, let me see what it says in the other Bibles, by the way, just, just out of curiosity. Um, NIV says unschooled, ordinary men. ESV, uneducated, common men. CSB, uneducated, untrained men. Same with NASB. Okay. So they took this word agramatos, which means literally, you know, illiterate, and they translated it as uneducated. Unlettered. Here's one here. The uh, lit, uh, Young's literal translation puts it a little bit more literal, <laughs> okay, uh, in the sense that it, it translates uh, agramatos as unlettered, okay, meaning that... Uh, uh, same with Darby as well here, unlettered and uninstructed men. So the point is that a lot of scholars today, now some of them say, well, first Peter is authentic, but not second Peter. Second Peter is is further down the ra rabbit hole than first Peter. But first Peter is down the rabbit hole too, really. I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, many scholars do not believe that it, it is authentic because of that, because the author seems to be uh, a very educated man in in uh, in in the Greek language and philosophy. Uh, we also have record of a uh, New Testament scholar uh, by the name of uh, Graham Stanton, and he uh, rejects the idea that uh, that Peter was the uh, the author of that uh, letter as well, because 
Uh, First Peter was uh, uh, most likely written during the reign of Domitian in AD, AD 81, okay? Uh, which he believes that, that uh, that's when the widespread, widespread uh, Christian persecution began long after, that was long after the death of Peter. Uh, we also have a scholar by the name of Travis Williams who says that the persecution describes, um, described, now this is the persecution described does not appear to be describing official Roman persecutions after Peter's death, thus not directly ruling out an early date for the, uh, for the creation of the epistle. Uh, so that's according to Travis Williams. Um, we have Bart Ehrman, um, New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman, and he says that he is convinced that the language, the dating, the literary style, and the structure of First Peter makes it implausible to conclude that uh, that it was written by Peter. So uh, I think it's very important for all of you uh, Bible school uh, Bible students or. Uh, those who, those of you who are st- really serious about studying the scriptures, it's very important to understand all of those things before we dive into First uh, Peter. So, let's do it. This is First Peter chapter one. Now, t- I know some people might be listening here; it might be new. Uh, they might say, "Well, how can you say that? Uh, you know, First Peter is not written by. How, how could that? How could that ever happen? How could they ever get away with with doing that?" Well. Uh, it's it's actually a commonly known thing among historians that people back in that time, in back in those days, uh, there was a lot of um, pseudographical things going on. I mean, it, it, there was a lot of people writing in the name of somebody else, uh, basically forging epistles, forging letters. It's like they would sit down, they say, oh, "Whoa." What would Paul say to Timothy? Um, okay, we'll write it down. We'll write this. And that's how they did. Or what would Peter say? You know, how, what would Peter say? It wouldn't really be Peter per se or Paul. Uh, and so that kind of practice was was a lot more common than it is today. Today we have a lot more. It's a lot more of a stigma against that kind of uh, practice, but not so much in those days. And that's why we have so many. Uh, letters, so many epistles that are pseudepigraphal. Okay, so let's do let's do this. This is First Peter chapter one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect e- exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Asia Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven uh, genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you know, or excuse me, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay quick little overview of this little so the author here that he has uh, speaking of God the Father he has given us he has given us new birth 
And he's talking about the rebirth, or as some people would say, the being born again. Now, according to the author here, he has given us that new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never uh, perish, spoil, or fade. So th the idea here is now, uh, apparently the author here, it, the idea here is very similar to that of Paul, where it's like you identify with the, the crucifixion, you identify with the resurrection, you are dead with him, you die with him, you are buried with him, and you rise with him in newness of life. Uh, so here is um, apparently talking about a spiritual uh, experience, not so the physical thing, uh, seeing that it says that he has given us a new birth. Um, now, this inheritance is something that is, according to the author here, is kept in heaven for you. Uh, who were th through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So this is interesting as well. Until the coming of the salvation. So a lot of people, a lot of people, um, a lot of people say, hey, we are saved. And I've, I have used this terminology as well, you know, quite often actually. But Really, I mean, the salvation that's, that's spoken of here isn't completed in the sense that it, we don't really have it all right now. I mean, we have it all spiritually, you can say. Uh, but here he is, the author says uh, that by faith, basically, we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So, so this author believes that the sal that salvation is not even come yet. Um, it's something that happens in, in the future, okay? So in verse 6, basically, uh, you, like right now, you, you, can, you can rejoice because even though you suffer many things, you know, all kinds of grief and all kinds of trial— uh, trials because, hey, you know that uh, uh, this is not the end. Um, you know, this we're just we're just making our way through it, and uh, soon enough we will have, uh, we will we will we will attain uh, what God has for us. Alan says, kind of weird, didn't the Sanhedrin say Peter was an uneducated man? Yes, we actually we. Um, I'm not sure, Alan, if you were uh, with us there earlier when we read um, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Yeah, so Acts chapter 4, verse th 13, Peter, it says that Peter was agramatas, illiterate or uneducated, as it says in Young, Young's little literal translation. Um, how is that, how is that put again? Um, uh, Unlettered. That's it. Unlettered. Unlettered. Yeah. So that's why a lot of a lot of scholars do not believe that First Peter was actually written by Peter. Alan quotes uh, Psalm fourteen verse one and Psalm fifty three verse one. I know both of those psalms are almost a copy of each other. Psalm fourteen verse one: The fool has said in his heart, "There is no God." They are corrupt. And have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. All right. Okay, so. So, uh, first, the first, um, this paragraph is really just talking about the future. Like, hey, you know, we don't have it all yet. We don't have salvation yet. Um it's coming and you know you're patient and through faith and patience you can uh, you can attain to it good evening over there on podbean good evening chris good to see you uh verse 10 this is first peter chapter 1 verse 10 concerning this salvation the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care 
trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Now, again, look at this. This is So the author here is saying that the prophets, speaking of the prophets of old, the prophets of the Tanakh, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets of the Tanakh, that's what it's referring to. Uh, so what this author here is saying is that those prophets in the quote-unquote Old Testament had the Spirit of Christ. They had the Spirit of Christ. And by the Spirit of Christ, they predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told uh, told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So there's a lot here in 1 Peter chapter 1 that that's looking it's looking into the future, right? It's not so much present. It's Jesus is coming, you know, the you know, all this stuff is is about the future. And so the author here is saying that the set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So again, there's this idea that the audience doesn't, these people don't have the fullness of the grace yet. Or at least the fullness of what the grace uh, can bring. Verse 14, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And I see over there on Podbean, Chris shared the live show. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing that. And yes, if uh, if any of you have anybody on your mind that you think needs to hear this stuff, share it. Be holy because I am holy. So that is found in uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45, and chapter 19, verse 2. So one thing you can tell uh, reading is, reading the, the Bible uh, is that God ha- has a very, very high value on personal holiness. And so this is good stuff. Uh, be holy because I am holy. That's that's quite the call because you think about it. A lot of people say only God, you know, you know, only Jesus, right? You, you, a lot of a lot of people say that, only Jesus can do. Oh, well, not really what it says. Only Jesus, apart from maybe in Revelation, only Jesus could open the scroll. But apart from that, the uh, you know the the command here is to be holy as God is holy. Like that's. That's quite phenomenal. That's quite profound. Be holy as I am holy, says God. And the word holy, for those of you who are new to this, means to be set apart, separate, okay? Uh, Meaning that you do not think like other people do. You are set apart. You are separate. You are not part of the world system. You don't think like the world. You don't act like the world. You don't live like the world. You are set apart. You are special, if you want to put it that way. Be set apart, special. Verse 17. Since you call on who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Hmm. Father who judges each person's work. Doesn't mention faith there. For you know 
that it was not with imperishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from uh, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope and hope are in God. Now that you now that you have purified yourselves, being the truth, obeying the truth, love it, you know, purified yourself by <laughs> this is good stuff. Purify yourself by obeying the truth, so that you so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. First Peter chapter 2, Therefore rid yourself of all malice and deceit, and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of, ev- of every kind. Newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For 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 in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, let me just stop here for a second. All this talk about stones and living stones and the building and all this, it reminds me of the shepherd of Hermas. For those of you who know the shepherd of Hermas, doesn't this remind you of the shepherd of Hermas? The shepherd of Hermas, by the way, is just a phenomenal book. Every but every believer should read and study the Shepherd of Hermas, and Lord willing, we will, we will uh, go through it again. We went through it. Uh, actually, I think I went through it here uh, on. Um, how many times did I go through it already? At least twice. I went through the Shepherd of Hermas. The Lord willing, we'll do it again. It's an, it's a phenomenal book. Absolutely. Okay, let's just quickly check out the reference here in 2 Peter 2, 6. So the reference is Isaiah 26, 16. So let's, let's check this out. Isaiah, excuse me, 28, 16. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone. Now, what is it? What did Peter say? I lay a stone in in Zion. So he left out the foundation part. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. A chosen and precious cornerstone. So again, he left out the tried stone. Um. Tried stone, precious cornerstone. A sure foundation. So he left out the foundation. He left out the foundation again, right? Yeah. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And it says, He that believeth shall not make haste. Okay. Uh, we got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. 
Uh, he that believeth shall not make haste ver- uh, versus uh, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. What's what's going on here? Let's uh, let's check the Septuagint. I'll skip on over. Uh, let me just see. First, I'll go to Isaiah chapter 28. Okay, put in Septuagint in here. So this is the Brenton Septuagint translation. And it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, even the Lord, behold, I lay for the foundations of Sion a costly stone, a choice, a cornerstone, a precious stone for its foundations. And he that believes on him shall be shall by no means be be ashamed. So that is again the author here of First Peter is obviously quoting from a scripture that is more like the Septuagint as opposed to the um, Masoretic. So like this, he that believes on him shall by no means be ashamed. Um, versus the Masoretic, the, the common King James, he that believeth shall not make haste. So another, yet another um, proof here that these authors of the New Testament seem to quote from the Septuagint, or at least uh, a manuscript that is very much similar to that of the Septuagint, one or the other. Certainly not the Masoretic, at least not in these. Sometimes the Masoretic is closer to the New Testament quotations, but as we all see, uh, often it's more like the Septuagint. Uh, the Septuagint it seems like these authors uh, went by the Septuagint, or at least went by a perhaps a Hebrew um, uh, text that that was the same that that didn't used to translate. Verse so the second Peter two verse eight and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes a fall. And that's from Isaiah 8.14. So let's check that out. Isaiah 8.14. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. Okay, so Isaiah 8.14 in the Septuagint. And if thou shalt trust in him, he shall be to thee for a sanctuary, and you shall not come up against him as as against a stumbling stone, neither against a f- the falling of a rock. Different. So First P- Peter says, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Septuagint, and you shall not come against him as a, as against a stumbling stone, neither against the falling of a rock. So in this case, it looks like the, the Masoretic is a little bit closer to the, I should say the First Peter is a little bit more like the Masoretic in this case, although it's different, right? The stone for stumbling and a rock of, uh, for, and for a rock of offense versus a stone that causes people to stumble on a rock that makes them fall. Moving on with 1 Peter chapter 2. They stumble because they disobey the message, also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So this is amazing uh, portion. Actually, that is actually taken from the Tanakh. So um, that is, I believe that's taken from, uh, what, 
I remember we read this. Uh, let's see if I can find it. There's actually a lot um, of references in the Tanakh that Okay, there's, there's a few from Deuteronomy here. There's a few from Deuteronomy. Okay, let me just pull it. Deuteronomy chapter 4. So let's do this. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of uh, Egypt to be his people and inheritance as you are this day, Deuteronomy 7, 6, uh, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 14, 2, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Okay, so there's there are several different passages. I, I remember reading, I'm um, pretty sure there's more, but there's several different passages that is very, very similar to uh, 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.10, once you, once you were not a people, what does that mean? Well, you see, in the Jewish mind back in those days, if you are not part of the covenant, or if you are, if you have not repented and come to God, you are basically not even considered to be people. You're, um, especially Gentiles, are considered unclean animals as opposed to people. So once you were not a people, in other words, you're un, you're unclean animals, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits you. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or, or to the governors uh, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in your reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are, who are harsh. For it is commendable someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his, in his steps. He, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Now, there's a footnote here, Isaiah 53, verse 9. So that's a very um, famous passage here. He made 
his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. So it's worded differently, as usual, but similar. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who just judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So again, we have this idea that um, we must identify with him or identify with the crucifixion, not just that he dies for us, like pay our, pay our debt as a lot of um, evangelicals would preach today, but rather that, he, that we died with him, died to sins, so we'd live this. In other words, in other words, his crucifixion gives us power to obey the Torah. Quote, by his wounds you have been healed, unquote, for, quote, you were like sheep going astray, unquote. Right? So that is Isaiah 53. Now, down here you see it says, see Septuagint. Again, the re- why would it say that? Because apparently in the other, um, in, in the Masoretic, it's different. Um, so Isaiah 53, 4, 5, and 6. Let's see what it says in the King James here. So surely he has he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the Septuagint, it says, He bears our sins and is pained for us, yet we accounted him to be in trouble and in suffering and in affliction. But he was wounded on account of our sins and was bruised because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with, and by his bruises we were healed. All we as sheep have gone astray. Everyone has gone has gone astray in his way, and the Lord gave him up for our sins. So that's that is different, different than what we have in the Masoretic. Okay, First Peter chapter three. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as uh, elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes, Rather, it should be of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters, if you do what is right and do not give give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For, quote, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from from deceitful speech. 
They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And that is found in Psalm 34, verses 12 to 16. Verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do not, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior, Christ, may be in, may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it... Only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you who spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery and lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Say, what does this mean here? Uh, For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. There are two different ways of taking this. Uh, the first way, uh, which would be those who are um, dead in sins, okay? As, again, the Shepherd of Hermas makes it very clear, there's people who are, you, you, you are alive um, physically, biologically, but yet dead in sin. So you are pretty, like you are considered to be dead. Um, so this is, that could be uh, taken that way, like you preach the gospel to the dead and you call them to repentance so that they would repent and live. You know, the just shall live by faith. Another one is, and, and I think this is the more unlikely uh, case, and that is that some people believe that Jesus went and, pre- and preached to the dead after he di- after he died. Um, although I think that that is probably not so accurate. Whatever the case is, there's a couple of different ways of taking this. I don't think, though, that this particular case here, um, uh, when it talks about pre- preaching the gospel to the dead, is talking about physically dead, because this, this second 
part of the sentence here wouldn't make any sense. I think it's talking to those who are still living in the flesh, but dead in the spirit. For Because if you're living in the flesh, you're still in this world, alive according to the world, okay? Uh, this would make sense, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body. That would make sense. But if you're already, de- like, if you're dead, as in, you know, uh, physically dead, this would not make any sense. Why would the, why would somebody physically dead be judged by human standards? Verse 7, the end of all things is near. Keep in mind, the author wrote this about 2,000 years ago. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. I've had someone ask me about this before. What does this mean, love covers a multitude of sins? Well, when you love somebody, okay, when when you really love your neighbor, let's say, for example, um, you don't hold things, you, 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 co- you cover their sins. They sin you and say, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. That's fine. You, you cover over their sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. But if you don't love, if you hate somebody, you don't cover over their sins. You point out every little thing that's wrong. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, What will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? I love this. This is is amazing. This is amazing. Oh, this is just awesome. Awesome. Um, I got to stop here just for a second because we got to digest this. Ruminate on this one for a little bit. Now, in other Bible translations, you say judgment begins in the in the house of God. So let's say we go to the King James, first Peter 4 17. For the time is is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not? Obey not. Again, it's not, whoever wrote this, if it's not Peter, it's certainly not Paul, because Paul would, wouldn't put obey in it so much. He doesn't like that, it doesn't seem like he likes that word. He, he likes faith better. Paul would say believe, not in the gospel. But here it says, obey not the gospel of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Why would judgment begin in the house of God first? Why why would judgment begin in the house of God? Because the house of God has the most responsibility. They're responsible. Now, when I say house of God, what I'm thinking of is every body of believers that wear the name of God. Okay, especially Christians who are 
say especially especially the Christian church, mainstream Christians. You you wear the name of God. You wear the name of Jesus. Judgment begins at the house of God. You see, Jesus told his followers, "You are the light. You are the light of the world." Okay, so if the house of God, if the Christian church is the light of the world, something's wrong with the Christian the Christian church because the world is look at the world now, it's dark. Jesus says to the Christian church, you are the light of the world. The world is dark. Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? You walk into a room at nighttime, you, you reach over, you flip the switch, and there's no... The lights do not come on. It's still dark. You know the power is still on because the lights on the other rooms and such. What? So... Where's the fault? The fault's at in the light itself. You got to change the light. We're we're living in the in the day and age when you have to. We should, you know, the the light be changed. And this is one of the reasons why we do what we do. The light the light needs to be changed. Unfortunately, the light went out. Most of these churches need to shut down. Completely shut down. Close shop, sell the building, get out of there and stop even wearing the name and the and the the name of Christ at all. Stop it. Just just close shop, done. Make room for the new light. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. Again, back in those days. Salt was not primarily used for taste. And I've heard preachers say this. I'm pretty sure that some of you may have heard, you know, maybe your maybe a pastor say this, you know, that, well, when Jesus said you are the salt of the earth, he just meant for you to, that you just make the world more tasty. No, no you're supposed to make the world more, more tasty. Back in those days, it wasn't, salt was not, the primary usage of salt was not to increase your sense of taste or to enhance your sense of taste, to enhance the food or whatever, um, the flavor, but rather uh, to preserve food. I used to work at a food processing plant, and even today I can tell you that a lot of food is shipped, put on ships and shipped over the ocean you know, across the Pacific or across the Atlantic. There are entire ocean liners packed with food. And the, the, this food that's on the ships are all salted, heavily salted. They're put in barrels or they're just dried salted food because, you know, you can't really refrigerate that amount of food. When they get to North America, they have to be taken to their to the um, respective warehouses or factories, and they have to be desalted unless you ship it right to the store and sell it salted. But a lot of this stuff has to be desalted. I worked at a place for many years that a lot of it, a lot of work that was done there was desalting because a lot of this a lot of this product would come over from you know from India or from you know uh, from overseas and uh, they would it would have to be desalted because it was all packed in 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 salt. So even today, I would argue that a, a good part of the salt that's, that's used today is used to preserve food from going bad. How much more back in those days before they had electricity, before they had you know refrigerators and freezers, they used salt to preserve to preserve. It was a preservative. So when Jesus said to his, to his followers, "You are the salt of the earth," what was he saying? He was saying, it's your job to preserve the ancient morals. It's your job to preserve this stuff from going. It's your job to preserve society from going bad. And what did he say about salt that lost its saltiness? He said, if salt loses its saltiness, it is good for nothing. Good for nothing. Throw it out. Trample under under your feet. 
a lot, much of the church today in the West has lost her saltiness. She failed to preserve the ancient moral. She failed to preserve society. And now we got a huge problem. That kind of church, according to the words of Jesus, has lost her saltiness. Good for nothing. In fact, it's even worse than good for nothing. It actually is, it's a, it's a, it's a force of evil in this world because people go to church and they get a false sense of security because they go to church and they walk in a dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking sinner and they walk out a dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking sinner, even more empowered because they feel like, Hey, I'm, I'm so good. I went to church. I shook the pastor's hand. He gave me his blessing. Look how good I am. I'm doing what any, I'm, I'm a good Christian. What a good part of these people are far from a good Christian. Far from a good Christian. First Peter 4, 17. Time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? So there has to be obedience here. Obey not the gospel of God. What will the outcome be for those who obey not the gospel of God? Now look at this. This is enough Verse 18 here is enough to, sh- you should be, uh, this is enough to shake anybody. And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? King King James puts it this way. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and a sinner appear? In other words, it's hard for the righteous to get saved, let alone the, the sinner has no hope. That's basically what this is saying. If you're ungodly or if you're a sinner, you're pretty much there's pretty much no hope there. You're you're so far out, you're so far gone. You need to run to God. Repent of all your sin. Then you won't be a sinner anymore. You'll be an ex-sinner. There's no such thing as a sinner saved by grace unless that grace makes that person an ex-sinner, gives that person power to repent of their sin, turn from their sin, power over sin, break the break the the bondage of sin over that person's life, then they're not a sinner anymore. I used to be a sinner, you say. But the, if the righteous are scarcely be saved, where should the ungodly and the sinner appear? Isn't that just amazing? Now, the footnote here says, again, see the Septuagint. Why? Because, again, this author, First Peter, quotes from the Septuagint, not from the Masoretic. Proverbs 11.31. Well, let's go to the Masoretic and see, see what it says. Proverbs 11.31. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Okay? That's, that's the, that's the uh, Masoretic. That's the King James. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the, the wicked and the sinner. Now... Go to the Septuagint, Proverbs 11, 31. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? There you go. Once again, once again, we have a New Testament author who quotes from the Septuagint, not from the Masoretic text. So, 
any New Testament student, any any person who is a who is study who studies New Testament text should always have the Septuagint at hand because the Septuagint it seems like the the New Testament text is more in line with the Septuagint than with the with the uh, with the Masoretic. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So again, let's 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 think about this. Let's ruminate on this a little bit more. A little bit more. Think about we're talking uh, the, the the author of First Peter mentioned the the flood, right? Noah's day. There were righteous people there, okay, so God waited for all the righteous to die off, and then, you know, Noah and his family went into the ark. Now, I'm sure that almost everybody, probably everybody in the world back in those days, they all thought they were good people, good people, just like everybody today thinks they're all good people. Everybody, a way, the way of a man, a man is always right in his own eyes, right? Always right in his own eyes. A lot of people were probably considering themselves to be good people. Probably even a lot of believers back in those days. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt there were a lot of people uh, in in Noah's day that were believers. I mean, hey, it's not it's not wasn't too far from the. Like, I mean, we, uh, they lived with Noah. Okay, they lived in the times of Noah. Probably places of worship. You got Abraham right there around the corner. Um, so, I mean, right in the right in the days of the of the early patriarchs, Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and, and out of the whole entire world that lived in that in those days. At least in that part of the world, if you want to look at it that way, if you want to say, you know, however far you you believe the flood went, the whole entire society, perhaps even millions of people, who knows, they were not saved. Only one family, only eight people were saved in the quote-unquote known world back in those days, if you, if you want to put it that way. So very, very few people were saved. Very, very few. Out of all the people that came out of Egypt, again, we have numbers here. It says 600,000 men. That, that, that does not include all of their wives. I'm sure that most of them had wives, probably multiple wives. So let's just say they each had one wife. So that, that makes way over, that, that makes 1.2 million right there. That's not including all of the children that they probably had. Okay. So I would, it's safe to say probably millions of people. God chose them to save them to bring them out of Egypt, okay, out of all the people in the world, God chose them. This is the chosen people of God, chose them, protected them, fed them, gave them water, provided for them. They, I mean, bent over backwards, more or less, to uh, show them wonderful, powerful signs and wonders all the way, all their life, pretty much. Yet, out of all of the called ones, out of all of those who were called special people of God, out of, uh, if you want to call them the righteous nation, you might. I don't know if you want to call them that or not. Call them right because God, out of all of the nations in the world, God chose them. They were the ones who were called, called out of Egypt. They were the chosen people or at least the ones who were called out of Egypt. Millions of them, and out of all of those millions of God's special people, only two really made it. Joshua and Caleb. Only two really made it. So two, only two, really found that 
really got saved pretty, I mean, in that sense. Two found salvation out of millions of, and this is not the world. The, this is the children of Israel. The, these are the God's covenant people. It's like, it's like saying uh, the church today, maybe. I don't know. I mean, whatever, however you want to look at it. Look, think about a, a group of people who is deemed as God's people. Now, out of God's people, this is not the world. The world is already, they're, they're long gone. I mean, as far as spiritually speaking, they're long gone. We have millions of God's people, and yet they were not, they did not make it. Only two, only two. If the righteous are scarcely saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's a very, very sobering thought. Very sobering thought. I would say, in my own opinion, I've, I've heard people say that Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23 is the scariest passage in the Bible, but this is pretty close to it as well. Verse 19, 1 Peter 4, 19, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Yeah, I see over there on... Pod bean, uh, Chris says, what was used in early times in Europe as a preservative, especially meat, salt worked well when crossing the Atlantic in North America, while in Asia, most countries used spices, particularly red pepper. Yeah, excellent. Amen. Okay. First Peter chapter five. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Excuse me. Um, but a be shepherds of God's flock. That is under your care. Watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, again, this is so much in First Peter about the future, so looking forward to the, to the appearing of Christ. You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This reminds me, you know, this reminds me, uh, my, my grandmother, I know I often speak of my grandmother, um, whenever somebody did something really good, like whenever somebody, let's just say the neighbor did something like really good, you know, she'd, she'd always say, well, there's another star in his crown. There's another star in her crown. You know, that's what she'd always say. Verse five. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to, the, to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Oh, do we ever... Everybody wants God's favor, right? Everybody, everybody wants God's favor. But... You want God's favor? Actually, in other Bible translations, it says grace. God gives grace to the humble. Everybody wants God's grace, God's favor. Yeah, well, you know, it's conditional. Uh, you have to, um, you have to be humble. You have to be humble. So, you can't just claim God's grace without being humble.
Yeah. God opposes the proud, but shows grace to the humble. Gives grace to... You don't want to be opposed. You don't want God to oppose you. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the, God, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him power forever and ever. Amen. Now, just before I read the final greetings there, true story. This this right here. Um, actually, I used, I think I used the, um, let me see now, 1 Peter 5. Yeah, I think it was this this particular um version when i was a teenager and i first started walking with god this is a true story first started walking with god and i was staying with my grandmother i was staying with my grandmother and um on she allowed me i forget i, don't, I forget where or why we had these things but we had like these the big letters, stickers, like they were stickers of like big letters, colorful letters, different colors. Um, you know, you just kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like a sticker. Big things. They, they weren't toys. They were, they were, but they're big letters, stickers. So my grandmother allowed me to put first Peter five, eight and nine, um, as soon as you walk in the house, it's right there. You can see it. Basically, it was it was on a um, it was it was actually on the side of a big it was it was on the side of a refrigerator. But I mean, you could see it really easily. Um, walking into the house is big letters: "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction." are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I had that. It was in big, I think it was red letters. As soon as you walk into my grandmother's house, boom, it was right there. And, uh, you know, we'd have visitors or people coming to the door or salesmen, you know, coming to the door and all this kind of people. And they would always be taken aback. You know, they'd always be they come in the door and like to talk or to try to sell something or something. It's like, it'd, it'd be like shocking to them to see these big red letters, you know, you know, resist the devil, resist the devil. Um, your adversary, the devil, he, seek, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking, seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith because you know, your brothers around the world are, or, um, are suffering the same kind of, of, uh, of things. So section. So that's an interesting, interesting experience there to see people coming through the door the way they responded. First Peter chapter five verse twelve. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends, her, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, notice this. She 
who is in Babylon. Now that's a very intriguing um, thing to say here. Uh, this is another thing that really causes people, uh, some scholars, to say that this is the dating of this is is. See, it's, this brings out a dating issue because the reference to Babylon here is generally agreed uh, to be a claim that the letter was written from Rome. Okay. Um, it is believed that the identification of Ro- that the identification of Rome with Babylon, the ancient enemy of the Jews, only came after the destruction of the temple in a- in AD 70. So this is what brings one of the one of the things that kind of brings into question uh the dating of this uh epistle as well um the authorship of it because if it's if it if it has if it's authored as late as how some of them think that it was like in AD 81 okay somewhere around there uh then that would have been long after the death of Peter okay yes so um there you have it we went through the entire book of first peter the entire book of first peter so, um, just before I get to the live chat here, one more time, one more time, a uh, quick little reminder, tomorrow we have with us uh, Jiva and Salojana Sam, It'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern as usual. They'll be talking about marriage, all kinds of different things of, about marriage, but especially their new, their new book, as you see here, The Unbreakable Marriage. We'll be talking about that as well. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, um, anybody who is married, thinking about getting married, or, you know, if you know of anybody who is married and needs a little help, maybe maybe they have a little bit of problems, highly recommend. You know, I honestly, if anybody has any kind of marriage problems, these are the people I would refer them to, number one without any question of a doubt, without any doubt. Okay. Uh, for sure. I would, I would say, you know, if you have anybody has any marriage problems at all, see Jiva and Salojana, send them a message, get a hold of them. The, you know, these people are wonderful people and, uh, and God has used them so powerfully in helping so many marriages out. And they have quite a testimony in regards to that as well. So we'll be talking about that tomorrow night, Lord willing. See what we have here in the live chat. Alan, I think this is was talking about Psalms 14.1 and 53.1. Uh, my point for the Psalms was for all of us, we were out of the covenant. Now be holy. Uh, you are in the covenant when you practice the ways of Yahuwah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, most were not taught this. We sought it. It's amazing. Isn't it amazing how God leads us? You know, how God leads us. I look back. I am I am absolutely amazed just looking back in the in the past and looking at, you know, where I come from. Even even this book, like I keep on saying this book here, uh, I, I purchased this book when I was a teenager. And I, I don't know, other than a, apart from a miracle of God, how do know enough to purchase this book author at all i never even heard of this book before never heard of anything about this before all i knew is that i was i was in a spiritual war uh i just came out of the world so to speak and and uh and i believe god led me to that book and it's amazing Yeah, Alan says, it started in early 90s when I began to hear, why don't we keep the fourth command? Yeah, the Shabbat. Shepherd of Hermas is great. 
Yes, absolutely. Love God, study scripture. Yeah, love God, study scripture. Amen. Ellen says, all of the earth was flooded, in my opinion. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, wrap it up for tonight. And uh, again, tomorrow night, if God puts anybody on your heart or on your mind to uh, to share uh, the link uh, for tomorrow night, please do so. Share it with somebody, somebody that may need it. Um, and as a, you know, uh, anybody who is even interested in perhaps getting married sometime in the future, I would I would highly recommend listening and. You know, bring in your asking your questions tomorrow night with to uh, Jiva and Salojana. They're a wonderful couple. I'm not sure how many of you have have uh, watched them uh, last year when they were with us, but uh, um, it's always good to have them on. Seek the Lord says, "God bless you, brother Christopher. Thank you for this study. Thank you very much. Seek the Lord. Do more. Thank you." Alan says, "Thank you, brother. Much love and blessings to you all. Thank you as well, Alan." Love and blessings multiplied back to you, brother. Liked. Thank you very much, Alan. Yes, please like. Chris over there on Podbean says, excellent sermon. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you, brother. Okay. See you guys tomorrow. Same time, same place. But this time we're going to have Jiva and Sologen with us. Lord willing. Okay. Love you guys. You guys are awesome. Keep on calling on uh, calling on him and he will show you great and mighty things. Keep on seeking and you will find, that's for sure. Vinny says, thank you, Christopher. Many blessings to everyone. Shalom. Thank you, Vinny. Wow. Chris uh, says over there on Podbean, I was able to post 51 likes to your uh, See us. Thank you very much, Chris. Yes, stay blessed. Y'all, thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks again. I appreciate each one of you. Thank you for your questions and your comments. Thank you for your likes. And I'll see you again tomorrow. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen. Amen. See you tomorrow night.